Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. I'm joined by John Paul Mason. It's Thursday afternoon, JP, and it's the week leading into the big one, the Glasgow Derby. There is massive talking points, not just about team selections, who's injured, who's suspended, who might be coming back, but everything else around about this fixture at the moment, JP. And, you know, the big thing that I continually go back to is the fact that the very fact that Scotland has this fixture in the first place is something of an anomaly. If you look at other football nations with a similar population, but we, as a football nation, um, as an authority, we don't even know how to manage it. We don't know how to commercialise it. We don't know how to promote it. We're going into this game on Sunday with no Celtic fans in the stadium. We're going in with a, a ref appointment that I thought was an April Fool's joke. And we're going in with a hate bill that's basically just mocked um, on mainstream media when they are referring to hate-filled songs. JP, that's the Glasgow Derby. That's where we are. That is what it's become. That's what it's become, JP. So uh, we better not talk about music this week then, eh? <laughs> and, well, we are um, talking about songs to a degree, so... Uh, yeah, true. But no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's exciting, something to look forward to and very much looking forward to Sunday. wish things were different and we were able to go, but um, it just seems weird saying like, your team that you support throughout the season. Uh, and I know that the argument will be, oh, well, you got offered 700 tickets and you didn't take them. But I mean, look what happens when you get 700 tickets. You know what I mean? You're, you're kind of taking your life into your own hands. It, like, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, it just seems weird that team you've supported was there on Sunday at Livingston. Massive support, massive away support, filling three stands. And then come the biggest game of the season, there is no, no away support. And it's just... It's just weird to me, something that I've not really got, I mean, I suppose I've got used to it now, it's been a good few years of this, and certainly the reduced allocation anyway, but, uh, you know, all my life it's been a large support at Parkhead, a large support at Ibrox, and you're aware of them being there, and they're aware of us being there, and they've certainly been aware of us being there uh, <laughs> more often than not in recent years. Um, when we've been there, but yeah, there's a lot to a lot to get into, I guess. There is JP, and the reason I started off with that, the fact that you know it's one of these derbies that I think it's a self-proclaimed biggest derby in world football. I'm not sure where else to call it that. To be honest with you, you do get outsiders um, who come in to uh, try and find out what is it about this derby that makes it different from anywhere else on the planet. And in actual fact, on that point. We've got a gig tonight in Glasgow. We've got another gig tomorrow in Grangemouth, right? With Paddy McCourt. Paddy's not been over for several years. Um, so he is looking forward to getting in and about the old Celtic support. And I'm pretty sure there'll be a sing song for his entrance tonight in Gracie's uh, JP, Don't Sell McCourt. Now, the, the thing with that is we got approached from two different documentary companies, right? The first one are traveling over. They've traveled, they're in Glasgow right now, traveled over from Germany. And they want to capture the build-up to the, the big derby, right? So, like, yesterday they went and visited St Mary's Chapel and they were filmed down there and they were talking to Canon White and all this. Tonight, they're going to be in and about Gracie. So they want to see the colours and, and hear the songs of an Irish Celtic boozer in the week leading up to a Rangers game. Paddy McCourt's going to be on the stage. They'll have a wee word with him. They'll have a, an interview with people. You know, they'll, they'll kind of stick about all night and all this kind of stuff. There is this interest globally around this derby in your view what makes it different from any other derby what makes it different from Liverpool and Everton what makes it different from anywhere else on, on the planet this particular is it hatred is it the level of hatred it's weird it's weird you should say that um because I was actually speaking about this at an unearthly hour this morning well an unearthly hour for me given that I got back from Edinburgh last night at half one in the morning from working the underworld gig, which I guess we, we can't and shouldn't go into. In lager, 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 lager. There is a link there, but like, we'll, we'll, we'll stray away from that subject for fear of uh, reprisals. Re repercussions. Uh, yeah. Um, but Dave McGeekin, who I work with at, at uh, DF, phoned me this morning at 20 past nine, not for anything work-related, simply to tell me that he was really excited that he met Davey Hay at his dentist. <laughs> Um, sitting in the waiting room chatting to Davy Hay for about half an hour and he said he was just an amazing guy and um, like that's the premise of the phone call and we ended up talking about other things 
he's a big Greenock Morton fan, so we're talking mm-hmm. about uh, the, the, the Greenock and Gurick connections to Celtic. I didn't know Mark McGee started his career at Greenock Morton. Here's, like a, here's one for you. Here's one for you, JP. Sorry to interject. We'll get right back into it. Mark McGee, right, when he was at Morton, played as a trialist for Celtic right. in, a, in, a, in a reserve game. Mm-hmm. He scored a goal. He actually scored a goal. We didn't take him up. We didn't. We had an option to sign him. We didn't take up the option. I think he went to Newcastle before mm-hmm. he came back to Scotland. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. This is all just off the top of my head. I think he went to Newcastle from Morton and then came back to play for that great Aberdeen side mm-hmm. under Alex Ferguson before mm-hmm. going to Germany because Gordon Strachan duped him into Hamburg. Germany. Hamburg. Yeah. Ah, he went to Hamburg, that's right. But he only went there because his best mate Strachan had apparently signed for, I think it was Kaiserslautern. Mm-hmm. So the two couples were moving to Germany. Mark yeah, McGee signed for Hamburg, to... Strachan decided to go to Man United instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where I would have gone. But, uh, so I, we were talking about that and then we, he mentioned uh, an, uh, one of the music agents, Jeff Meal, who's a massive Liverpool fan. And uh, I said, oh, he's a Liverpool fan, isn't he? And he said, oh, I, I hates Everton, like calls them all the names under the sun. And I was like... I, Liverpool Everton doesn't seem to me to be that kind of like fierce rivalry. It doesn't it, whenever a Liverpool Everton game comes around, I don't really get that kind of um, feeling that there's that kind of um, real deep rooted hatred. But I mean, according to Dave, Jeff does detest Everton in a major way, and I'm pretty sure there's Everton fans that detest Liverpool and vice versa, you know. But and then we got talking about David being. Uh, with Kieran Tierney at, uh, I forget what gig it was, but obviously because Dave's a promoter, he'll get to meet people that are there in, in the backstage area. And he was speaking to Kieran Tierney um, and Kieran Tierney was telling him that all oh, the, the folk down south, you know, Arsenal, Tottenham, that's the rivalry, that's the big game and everything else. And mm. he was like that to them. It's nothing compared to a Celtic Rangers game. I mean, you're dreaming if you think that this is even a fraction of, of what, it's like up there with the build up and everything and things like this, us talking about the game and just people in pubs and it's 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 so all encompassing to answer mm-hmm. your question. Um everybody knows that it's coming. You can feel it in the air almost that it's that it's that week. And then come come the day of the game, like no matter how confident you are, you still are a bag of nerves. Um when you see that those team sheets come out and players running out and all the rest of it, it's, it all, it all kind of crystallises and focuses at that point and you're like, right, okay, I'm going to have to just forget about everything else for the next 90 plus minutes and concentrate on, on this game. The the emotional element of it, you're talking there about Liverpool, I've got a couple of Evertonian mates um, and, a, and a couple of Liverpool ones as well, but I was always of the view that, you know, you would actually see pockets, say, blue in the Liverpool end and all that stuff on Derby Day. So that, that's that's taking you to a completely different level of rivalry, JP, because that simply would not be tolerated in this particular discussion, right? And I, I was thinking about it today. What is it that fuels this game more than any other Derby in the world? And is that being chipped away at by stupidity or a weak authority who can't come in and sort out a situation like the ticket allocation. We're going back to 2018, six years ago, this started, this began. Um, and only now is the authorities stepping in to find some kind of resolution. And mm-hmm. it's not even ideal, is it? The 3,002 and a half. There's even question marks around whether or not that will be the figure. Um, I had resigned myself to thinking that there's going to be a generation of fans not seeing this fixture. Mm-hmm. JP, you know, never, never going to Ibrox. And um, I mean, Will we ever have the, the, the full broom loan, the free broom loan? Probably not ever again because they've sold some of their tickets. Unless, of course, they fill in the, the corners of the stadium, they increase the capacity and they can move season ticket holders in there. But the, the reason I'm asking it is because we've had, as I say, a German documentary team coming tonight. Tomorrow we're in Grangemouth and we've got a big documentary team coming to that gig, a different one from down south. And they're just absolutely intrigued with us you know, Glasgow Derby thing and and why I put it down to, right, you've got rivalry and then you've got actual hatred. Where does the hatred come in? It's the sectarianism. It's the bigotry. And then 
if you have been part of that and ingrained in it for a number of years as a player and a manager as Alan McCoyst has, surely you understand that. And you can't just make flippant remarks in relation to the songs that Rangers fans will be singing this weekend. Um, and my issue with that is Alan McCoyce is one of these guys who's got a he's got a personality on media. Um, I remember watching him on Question of Sport. Every, there was a big loving, wasn't there? A big Alan McCoyce loving um, at that time. And he's obviously taking that onto football punditry. But to make a comment like that, I'm going to take you back to a comment Brendan Rodgers made about a month ago when he was t- talking to, uh, who's it, Jane? Jane from the uh, BBC? Jane Lewis, yeah. Jane Lewis. And he said, good girl. And it was a comment, JP, that in that part of the world, because there was a lot of people who came out and said, that's what we do. That's what we-. It's like, good lad, good girl, whatever it might be, right? Um, you know, it, it's just a, a turn of phrase. He was lambasted. I've I seen some of the comments from fairly high-profile uh, media guys going on about Brendan Rodgers being a dinosaur and all this kind of stuff, JP, as if they were trying to turn it into a sexist situation, which it was not, where he was demeaning a female in an interview, which he was not. And we have seen people doing that um, in the Scottish game over the last few years. Brendan Rodgers was pulled over the coals to the point where he, he made a, an apology to Jane um, Lewis in private. He then spoke about it to try and draw a line under it. McCoy's is getting off scot-free. They all just had a wee laugh about it, a wee giggle. Isn't that part of the problem, the fact that we're not tackling the issue? Well, if I think about what happened at the weekend at Livingston, I'm a a good friend of mine. I mean, I'm talking going back to the mid-90s. I've been pals with this guy, and he's a really good guy. Mad Livingston fan, been a fan of Livingston since the start. And he was absolutely outraged by our display. And I think it kind of went both ways. He was trying to sort of say, oh, well, it's the same with them when they bring all the, the poppy stuff and all the rest of it. And um, he was trying to sort of equate the two and everything else. And I went, Scott, I have to stop you there. You realise who was on that banner and what it was in remembrance of. I went, if you're offended by that, then don't go to Dublin on holiday. you know. And And then I sent him a link which had a brief explanation of why Celtic was founded. And then I sent him a link to why the Republic of Ireland is the Republic of Ireland. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of shot him, not shot him down. I wasn't trying to shoot him down. I was just trying to sort of say, look, this was not antagonistic. It was a celebration. Mm-hmm. Uh, what yeah, the, only, the, the only thing I could have had a, an issue with being a home supporter was the fact that, we were allowed to like display it on the actual track side. I was quite taken aback at the fact that we were allowed to do that because I've never ever seen a banner being walked on to the, the track side of the pitch. It and was some size of a banner. How did they smuggle it in? How the hell did they smuggle it in? Come on. I, I don't think they smuggled it in. I think they got permission to open the gates. So they got it through security gates and then yeah. the next thing the next thing it was being unfurled right in front of me, you know, uh I was obviously in the, the stand opposite the, the the dugout, and I was like, "Wait a minute, how is this? How is this being allowed to happen?" Not in a kind of outraged way, but more in a kind of like, "I'm absolutely aghast that this." How, is did, how did they pull it off? Yeah, I was like, "Is someone has money changed hands here or something like that?" Because, um, you know, I know they had a, a one big last payday where three stands of Celtic fans, but maybe an extra five hundred quid in the back pocket of a security guard to get the to get that banner in. So that would be the only thing that I was miffed about. But it just shows that, I mean, Scott's not the type of person that would be anti-Catholic or anything like that. I think he was just seeing it as, he basically admitted he didn't understand. He didn't understand. That's part of the problem, I think, because then people just, they just lump it all in yeah. the same pot. So Celtic fans displaying that banner, JP, is lumped into the same pot, right? as the kind of singing that Alan McCoy was referring Mm -hmm. to that will be prevalent at Ibrox on Sunday. And this is the issue. It's an educational thing, not because you're high and mighty and and, and you're trying to preach to anybody. It's just that you're you're so involved in Celtic history that you know the history, if you know the history, um, that you understand exactly the difference between the two. Um, But I think in Scottish football, in Scottish society, unless you're so involved, JP, it's so easy for them just to say, you're all as bad as each other and it's all the same problem, it's all the same thing, when it isn't. It absolutely, it absolutely isn't. If you're celebrating 
the origins of the very genesis of Celtic Football Club, who are you hating? You're not hating yeah. anybody. You know, whereas if yeah. you're up to your knees in a certain type of blood, that's hatred. That's absolutely mm. hatred. And it's completely different from the banner. But again, what you've seen is let's ramp up the banner story, right? So that Celtic are just as bad as the Rangers that Alan McCoy is referring to. And I just think that we're too switched on now to fall for that kind of stuff. Then, then there's a counter that comes back with, uh, oh, uh, why don't you go home and all of mm-hmm. that, and which is in itself inherently racist. Um, and you would never say that about, or you would never be allowed to say that about um, people of Asian uh, descent who happen to live here or been born into Scotland or whatever, or, or, or black people. You can't, that's just not accepted in modern day society. But... Irish, that's fine. Uh, and, you know, it, that's a thought that is shared by a lot of people. And and then they'll be like, oh, what's it got to do with Celtic? What's Ireland got to do with Celtic? And, you know, you're, you're flying a foreign flag and everything else. It's like, well, trace it back to the origins of the club. You can't escape that. It's not as if it's a made-up story that's yeah. just been created to affirm some sort of Irish kind of uh, narrative. It's not. <laughs> it's, it's there in black and white. And a lot of people don't like to accept that as reality. When you talk about it even, or write about it, I wrote a blog about it the other day, and bizarrely, uh, and I'd always all find this bizarre, the amount of Rangers fans who have actually read the blog, JP, and then criticise you for daring to start talking about uh, the Irish back story to Celtic Football Club, and the fact that there has been a prejudice for a long, long time due to that backstory, due to that being the app, you know, the, the whole reason for the existence of Celtic Football Club, Manchester United, Dundee United, Hibs. And Celtic have, have maintained that Irish identity a lot more than many, if not all, of these other clubs. And a big part of that is through the fan base. Now, we, we spoke about, uh, obviously, the, the cash and the cash grab of the St Paddy's Day commemorative shirt. Which I certainly don't agree with, and I said you know? that. Aye. Yeah. And, and that that is something that we, we spoke about. It's not with hindsight, and we're like, right, there's two things here. We, we, do we celebrate our Irish identity? Because if we do, we celebrate it every day. We don't just celebrate it on St. Patrick's Day where we can release an item of merchandise that can make us money. And then we stand up for that Irish heritage, JP. So when a fan or a fan group or a, a group of fans decide to unfurl a flag in celebration of that Irish heritage, why are they apparently, and I, I'm, I'm going to bring this um, point up, I've not seen this confirmed, of course, but I've heard that there was a, a meeting uh, the board held a meeting, and it was about it was about the flares and the banner. And I'm thinking, right. So on the one hand, let's let's get the old cash grab. Let's get the St Paddy's Day jersey out there, and all the all, other merchandise that goes with it, and make some money off it. But don't unfurl that banner. That, that just well, reeks I mean, of hypocrisy for me. Again, the only thing I would uh, come down on the side of of um, it was the fact that if it, if they did contravene any agreements that were made with Livingston or anything like that, like the actual content of the banner banners, because obviously there was another one at half time as the team were coming back on, we hold on to our title um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which there's nothing remotely offensive about that, I mean that's just a football a football banner but the only thing I guess that there the could be needle between the Green Brigade and the boys and the board is that they've done something you know off off the what's the word not off topic but off how, how would you say that when they've, if they've gone against the wishes of livingston basically is what i'm trying uh-huh. to say yeah which obviously can create friction between livingston the club and celtic the club i mean i wouldn't be too concerned about that but obviously Celtic want to be seen as doing doing the right thing or whatever. So who knows what the detail of that meeting was? I would sincerely hope that it wasn't to do with the actual uh, contents of either banner, and it was more to Rather do with a contravention of that. the agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would hope that was what it was. Surely anyway. they're not that blind to the to understanding how the fans feel, JP. <laughs> I mean, they engage with us all the time. Yeah, don't they? No, they don't. Mm. Anyway, no, I, I think it's a fair point, JP. And obviously, th- there's been a a breakdown in the relationship and also the communication between these fan groups and the club this season to the point where they were banned. You know, they were banned in the atmosphere. Th- these are things that have happened 
uh, throughout this season that we've discussed, you know, the, the issues facing Celtic. There's been this um, kind of fragmentation of the relationship between the ultras and the club. There's been these issues with the injuries that, thankfully and hopefully, that even more of them clear up this weekend, seem to be levelling out a wee bit. There's been the issue with recruitment. Um, there was the initial issue where a lot of people know wanting Brendan Rodgers back. So there have been all these kind of side stories that are taking your focus away from the football. I mean, we've not even mentioned who's playing left back on Sunday. <laughs> we know who it will be. But, you know, the, these are the things that, again, I think that it needs to be dealt with um, in a separate in a separate way. You can't you can't take what Celtic fans are, have been doing and what Alan McCoist um, has admitted Rangers fans will be doing on Sunday and say, ah, oh, these are both, you know, pant- pantomime villains, uh, the ugly sisters, what else are we called? Two cheeks of the same backside and all this kind of stuff, JP. It's not like that at all. You've got to deal with the situation uh, on its own merits uh, or otherwise. So we're going into that game. I think that the authorities have been very slow to act on the ticket issue. That This, as a spectacle, should not be exclusively for Rangers fans to attend. You know, um, How much of a benefit will that play towards Celtic? Well, I'm going to flip that. If things aren't going Rangers' way at the weekend, they, they, they would We'd maybe hope that there wasn't a fifty or thousand Rangers fans in that stadium because they're very quick to turn, aren't they, JP? They are. Uh, they're, 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 there's no doubt at all that it is a partisan crowd, and they'll be fully up for the game on Sunday, and they'll they'll be fully uh, behind uh, the manager and the team prior to kick off. Like you said, if things don't go their way, <laughs> um, it could it could go. The other way, um, but it's something that the, the players, our players, have got to cope with. And the good thing for us is that we do have players that have coped with that before. I mean, Joe Hart's had broken glass thrown at him at that ground. He'll be in mm-hmm. goals on Sunday. Um, Carl McGregor has played how many games there? Who knows? I mean, uh, a stato could tell you, but I, I don't know. But it's got to be north of twenty-five games there, maybe more, I don't know. Um roughly. Now let's think about that. So he's been a a regular now, has Callum, for ten this is his tenth season of being an yeah, was obviously regular. The seasons when they weren't there was no Rangers. So um Yeah. So how um, many seasons have they been back up in a position since to twenty sixteen, isn't it? So twenty sixteen, seventeen. Eight. So eight eight season times four, where times two plus a few. Yeah. Aye, twenty odd, thirty games. Aye, yeah. Brooks. So, I mean, he's got that experience if he's able to play. Obviously, there's still a doubt over that. Matt O'Reilly's been there a bunch of times. Kyogo's put them to the sword. <laughs> and, and, well, the last two games at Ibrox, he's scored there. So, he scored in the scored in the two each game and he scored in the game earlier on the season. So, um, he's he knows what to do. Maeda's scored there. Um that there's there's a good amount of play. obviously there'll be newcomers in uh in Kuhn uh, if he starts which I would expect him to but I was talking to to Melly on Sunday at the, at the game and and we we're just sort of saying like this this is the biggest game of his career that I don't I would doubt that there's been a bigger game that he'll have played in despite the clubs that he's been at because he's not I don't think he ever really got to play in any meaningful games for Ajax or was it Bayern Munich was he was that as well Bayern Munich yep yeah I don't think he ever would have played in I don't even know did he break through did he break through for the second team that's the thing I don't I don't think he did so (laughs) this stage for him is what he's been training towards for his entire life and yeah I mean he's got talent we've seen it now and what an opportunity what a platform to to put yourself on to play and but that is the thing is it is a hostile atmosphere and it's how it's a, it's a definitely a sink or swim moment for him but he's got he'll have the confidence of his teammates who've been through it before um, and and actually I was talking about first games I asked Melly what his first game was his first ever Celtic game was three 0 at Hamden against Rangers. I remember it well. I remember the game well. I remember Vata scoring and he, he celebrated. He done the George Cadet celebration before Cadet signed. He done one mm-hmm. of them. Um, and I also remember my seat at Hamden was behind the goals, right? So it's like binocular territory, JP, right? 
And I remember my eyes are the best anyway. But Brian McLaughlin went on a wee mazy run. And he was brought down on the edge of the box at mm -hmm. 3-0. But me and everybody around about me thought it was a penalty. And you're thinking, hmm. we've beaten Rangers 4-0 in the day. This is, a, this is wild. You remember Billy Thompson was in goals for Rangers? Ah, I saw that. The United I looked, goalie, yeah. I looked at the team lineups to see who was uh, to see who was playing, and it was, it was just mad thinking back to that season that we weren't at Celtic Park. It was a it was a weird one. I've got all highlights of games taped off the telly from that time, and, and it was just a, an odd one. An yeah, odd one. I, his first game was a, a victory against Rangers in the nineties, which was a a, a, a rarity um, to, to say the least. So I but I. With regards to the atmosphere, yeah, obviously we're aware of what it can be like, but the motivation for me as a as a Celtic player on Sunday would be to do everything I can to silence it and, and like you say, to turn it the other way. Because they've, they've got many players capable of doing that exact thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just about whether or not it comes together on Sunday and, and whether or not we are allowed to play the way that we want to play and if we're allowed to keep 10, 11 men on the pitch um, for the 90 minutes, because we've got a referee in charge of the game that is astonishing that he's been given that game. A absolutely astonishing. We might talk about that, actually, GP. What do you think? Um, the big thing for me is that game that Melly mentions, I remember it vividly. I, I, it's bizarre, that, isn't it? You can remember things vividly, like Celtic games or things involving bands. But ask me a question about geography or science at school, and I was it was just baffling. How can you remember everything in minute detail, every minutiae of, of detail when it comes to Celtic music? But when it comes to other subjects, it's just difficult, you know, when it came to exams. Give me an exam on Celtic in the 90s, and I might do all right. But that <laughs> game that Merle refers to, it was a previous season, again, just from memory, that we went to Ibrox, and they locked us out. Mm -hmm. They locked us out, and it was um, coming to the, I think it was the last game at Ibrox of that season between Celtic and Rangers, and it was all to do with this argument about broken seats. So the club had an agreement, the two clubs had an agreement, that every single time we play each other, there's X amount of broken seats. So what happens is you pay for them. I think that was the agreement. But then David Murray just wanted to, you know, I don't know, just uh, flex a wee bit, JP, at that time. Not and like it. I know, aye. And he banned Celtic. Uh, listening to the Celtic Exchange and, and Hugh Keevans um, talking about that phone call. It was him. I didn't realise it was him that took the phone call from David Murray with the famous quote, if they spend a fiver, I'll spend a tenner. I didn't, didn't realise that. I need to watch yeah. all that. I've, 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 I've clocked that there's a bunch of interviews with Brian Dempsey and uh, Hugh Keevans. Top Keevan. class. Is Top class. Jim Moore on as well. Jim Moore, David Lowe, Matt McGlone, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Grant, Hugh Evans, Brian Dempsey, and I think the next one's uh, Granty, Peter Grant. So he'll, he'll be talking, obviously, from the perspective of how this affected the dressing room and all this kind there's of a, stuff. There's a live gig idea for you right there. Well, I, I, and I'm not even saying this, I, I, I went through a contact to try and get Fergus to do it. Imagine that. Imagine a live mm -hmm. event with him. Wow. But um, we'll see what happens, because it is the 30th anniversary year, I guess, so it could be at mm -hmm. any point this year. Um, but yes, uh, Tino will be joining me on Monday for a Wonder Room Paradise to talk about that and this upcoming game. I'm pretty sure that'll get mentioned. But that game, we were locked out at Ibrox. And uh, the last thing I mentioned, that somebody popped up in the comments, JP, because they were actually, they were either um, responsible for, or they knew the person who was responsible for flying that plane with a big oh, yeah. banner. <laughs> hail, hail, the Celts are here, underlined are. Um, and then there was a few other fans who managed somehow to get into the game. But it was one each. John Collins scored one of his Predator free kicks. A bizarre celebration because he had nowhere to run. So he just lay on his back and you can you remember it? He lay on his back with the yeah. And you see the souls of the Adidas Predators. Good, nice, nice wee bit of commercialism there for Collins. And I think, although this is just for memory, Mikhail Chenko scored for Rangers, I think. Mm -hmm. But in that Celtic team were a few youngsters. Simon Donnelly played in that game, ran his socks off. And I've asked Sid and anybody else who's in the game who played in that game what it was like and they said exactly what you said there they've gone in and the motivation for them in the dressing room going into that game was to silence the crowd just to get it right up them in the rain the rain backyard you know and a one each draw would you take that this weekend jp i i would i, I mean obviously we want to win and but you, you kind of feel a wee bit greedy when you've already won 
two games against them this season and you're going for a third, you're like, does that really happen still, even in modern day when we're, we're we are the no no question we have been the dominant club. Uh, you know, we're, we're, I, I, I was loath to say something else there because that's their catchphrase, isn't it? But um, and I would never ever think like that. But we have been the dominant club, and um, you you kind of have a, you still have a bit of imposter syndrome with games like this. You still, even though you would think that the odds would suggest that we have a, a better side, we, we, we won the treble last season, and there be I don't know why there'd be such a huge disparity between the sides. Um, they lost at home at Motherwell only a few weeks ago with 11 men. <laughs> and and that conveniently was just sort of pushed to one side the next day because we lost and therefore oh, no, no harm done or whatever else. But this supposed um, juggernaut was was stopped in its tracks by Motherwell in, in their own ground. So... I'm sorry to say, but if Motherwell can go there and get a victory, then we should as hell can as well. <laughs> and we, we've got the tools to do it. Um, but I, I, it would be it would be my motivation 100% to to go out there and silence them. If we come away with a one each draw, then that certainly will not be a good result for them. There will be no cheering from them if they if they end that game all square. Um, I would imagine there maybe would be booing potentially because they at, at this point in time i think they think they can just take us apart mm -hmm. and there's no evidence to suggest that they can do that yet i mean i mean that could that could unravel on sunday but right now there's no evidence to suggest that they can do that because they've not done it um they have they've chipped away a, a a lead that we had but not through any of their doing really it's been our uh, poor form in games that have lost points to Kilmarnock and Harps and whatnot mm -hmm. um, at a time when we were struggling with confidence, cohesion, injuries, suspensions. And then suddenly you see a team on Sunday with Rayo Hatate, Matt O'Reilly, <laughs> Iwata I thought was really good as well. A guy that we signed only a couple of months ago and couldn't play really, really well. Maeda mm -hmm. on the other side. The defence has got Carter Vickers back in it. We've got our first choice right and left back. I mean, that you suddenly see that all this narrative of this, oh, this is the worst Celtic team since the nineties, and you know, I can't remember it. They, that's what they were at some point in the season. Yeah. People were saying that, JP, uh, and Celtic fans as well. I know, um, I know. And you're like, wait a minute, it's it's not as bad as that. It's yeah. not great. There's been times this season where it's not been great. I mean, that Hearts game at home. The 2 0 defeat was horrific. I mean, it really was. We didn't offer anything in that game to suggest that we were going to get a draw at 2 0 down, never mind a victory. But I think without wanting to sound all uh, full of excuses and everything else, there has been mitigating circumstances for the, the reasons that we've not played as well as we have done in the last few weeks. And then people will say, oh, we're only beating Livingston and St. Johnston and then Livingston again and everything else. But these these games have, have allowed the team to start remembering that they can play well. And there's that kind of cohesion that we've we've been lacking and getting to see a, a midfielder in Rayo Hitati, who I've never really been like, I remember when everybody got excited about him after he scored against Craig Gordon at Tynecastle, I was like, yeah, he looks good, but... Everyone was like, oh, he'll be our next 20, 25 million pound player. I'm still not convinced that he is that, but he's definitely a 10, 15 million pound player, I would say, if he's if he stays on top of his game. Um, but he's done the damage in in games and he definitely, definitely brings something completely different to that team. That positivity, people have said it many times this week, but the way that he just takes that, that touch and immediately looks forward yeah. like Callum McGregor does as well. But I think Ray Hattati's just got a little bit more of the creativity um, and is allowed to have more of the creativity as well. And you saw him, the way he was picking out passes, even on that horrendous pitch, which, by the way, I'm so glad to be seeing the back of that. It's, that first half, I said to Melly, 
that's that the, the team were basically getting to grips with the pitch in the first half. Like yeah. you can mm-hmm. see that they were afraid to make a mistake. There were so much concentration on every single pass because you, the bounce is different and everything's different on that pitch. Um, and these guys are good footballers, as they proved in the second half when they would had a, a forty-five minutes under their belt of playing it around and figuring out how it bounces and everything else. And and then once you get the goal, they re- they relax and you can start not being as worried about making mistakes and misjudging passes and everything else because that was all very very possible in that first half, you know. And all you need is one mistake and suddenly Livingston have got a goal yet having had like almost zero percent possession no shots on goal or whatever I mean mm-hmm. that, that's how it can happen we've lost there before um, the, the only thing I'm going to miss about Livingston when they go down which seems that there's an air of inevitability about that now is um, the fact that they give us the three stands that's the only thing right I think more clubs need to look upon that and embrace it JP, going right back to the top of the show, what makes this particular game, you know, have so much kind of global um, renown and and coverage at this time and all this kind of stuff? And then you look at some of the other aspects of the Scottish game and you think, within our own country, you've got clubs who don't want us anywhere near the stadium. Mm. You know, that they're cutting Celtic ticket allocations here, there and everywhere now to the point where they're normalising it. And you get to that point where it's like, right, they don't, they don't want us in their grounds. They actually don't want Celtic fans in their grounds. Whereas Livingston uh, have looked upon it as a business decision and they've made the right decision. But what one thing again about that stadium, and, and even Ibrox, I saw Jackie Mack get an interview there yesterday, is this isn't OCD, right? This is just like general maintenance of your stadium and your stadium being beamed worldwide on a regular basis. So there's Jackie McNamara getting an interview by Sky Sports it was. He's standing in Ibrox and in the background there's about a hundred different shades of blue on the seats and they're all very old and needing replaced all this kind of stuff you look at Livy it's exactly the same JP I mean obviously when it's mobbed it looks brilliant it doesn't matter what the seats look like but it's just this kind of tin pot attitude towards just the simple things to make the thing look better you know what I mean and you look at some of these stadiums and they're decrepit they're falling to bits and you think to yourself how they badly managed are you? They turn down money that's just basically sitting there waiting for them to grab from Celtic fans and I, I do think that the three stands is a little bit too far the other way you know but then they literally don't have a big home support they didn't even fill their own stand that they had I mean that tells you everything I mean and folk can say oh 12 o'clock kick off on a Sunday or I had the Wayne's football or you know I like this that and the next thing there's all these those excuses that came that Hearts fans were coming out with when they didn't sell out Tynecastle the last time we played them and beat them um, that was all the excuses you were getting. Oh, you know they they, they normally they normally like beat us, and they don't want to hear all their songs. And they're like, wait a minute, are you a supporter of your football club or are you not? You either support the team, regardless of the weather, regardless of the kickoff time. All of these things shouldn't really matter. You should, if you're a fan and a supporter of that club, you should be willing to go and watch a game played at midnight. I would go and watch Celtic playing at midnight. I mean, it's an insane idea, but if there was a Celtic game kicked off at midnight at Celtic Park, I would be there. <laughs> well, but but then a lot of Celtic fans have to work around uh, the games getting played during the night wherever they are. So you look at like you know your boys um, over in the states, Tony Curran and Martin Comston and Gianni Capaldi and all that, and and all these people that have to make um, arrangements around getting up to watch the game. Sometimes when I'm t- talking to uh, Ian Conroy on on this. It's like half past one in the morning <laughs> and mm. he's on a Celtic state of mind. Ridiculizer, just uh, as you say that, I live in Tenerife, says uh, Ridiculizer. I love in Tenerife. That's a different tweet, different comment altogether. I don't make the games. I guess that makes me less of a fan. Absolutely yeah. not. Absolutely not. Okay. You know, the Celtic, yeah, the Celtic fan base all over the globe. We've got, uh, just off the top of my head, Ian Roy pops up on the comments on a regular basis, lives over in the States. When you look at the contributors at um, in Axon, we've got Hungary, we've got New Zealand, Japan, Australia, no, Sweden, my point, Ireland. My point with regards to the Hearts fans not attending games was like, if you've not got a big enough support to fill your own three stands, then don't cut our allocation to 600 or whatever it is. Like, give us 
either half of the stand or the whole stand or whatever. I mean, if you want a full stadium for a game. And the, I'm pretty sure the last time when they uh, beat us 2-0 there, it wasn't sold out either. And there was, nope. there was spare seats aplenty that time as well. And it's just this kind of stubbornness of like, oh, we, you know, we, we don't need your money and that kind of thing. I was like, really? You don't need money? In 2024... You don't need money, right? Well, a business doesn't need extra. Good luck, good luck to you then, if that's the case. I mean, I, I'll it's just bonkers. watch for free. It's a bonkers attitude, JP. And you know, that's a club that have been in administration, right down to the point of having to agree a CVA to stay in business. And then they're getting offered free money and they're knocking it back. Absolutely bonkers, right? What other industry in the world would do that? And you look at um, some of the other kind of smaller clubs, more provincial clubs, what they need to be doing is they need to be embracing the ultra movement. Because ultra movement gets a certain section of your fan base interested in football. There's a lot of these guys go to the games because they're an ultra, JP, and because they are organising and they've got their drums and they've got the capo and they've got tifos and all this kind of stuff. And that's the thing that attracts them to the game. It's, yeah. no, it's no watching Motherwell or Livingston, is it, really? If Livingston were selling three of their, three of their stands and giving us one stand and they were selling out those stands, there is no we've got no argument at that point because like, well, they've got a... A, a partisan home support everybody turns out it's a community club it's a good thing for the community blah 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 we get one stand that makes sense with their way support but the fact is they've looked at it and gone well we don't have that support and we have got empty seats at pretty much all of our home games mm -hmm. as I've seen on the telly it would be absolute lunacy for them if they went you're still only getting one stand and they'll be two empty, completely empty stands and one half empty stand where we're supporting it. Can you imagine? Like, we just look insane. Like, everyone from outside in looking in would be like, why are they not doing that? Like, oh, they just don't want Celtic's money. They don't want our money. JP, right. it's bizarre. Okay. Okay. It's bizarre. Right. We're, we're talking about, um, you, you mentioned it, and it did happen. And I'm not sure if it was on the comment section on here or on the socials, but I read people, Celtic fans, saying, this is the worst team since the night. I actually know a couple of them uh, that say that Paul McGurk brings this up. He loved that that top behind you, right? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because that top was between the 90s and now. But, and I remember it, and I've got to always remember it for the rest of my days because I got married the day that we wore that jersey against FC Salzburg away. You remember the score? <laughs> Two each. Right. One of their games where you're... You know, you're trying to get the, the game at some point throughout the, the, the evening. It was a nighttime game. Um, it was also because it was the 18th of September. It was the day that the vote came in for Scottish independence, JP, as well, which um, I think, I don't know if it was coincidental that we were wearing a, a jersey that had a bit of tartan on it. Um, but the, the reason I'm bringing that up is because the comment I mentioned it, right? But it was 2-2 two -two that night, okay? And I remember I remember the, the Celtic goal scorers because obviously it was on a day that... Uh, is etched in my memory um, for all the right reasons. Wacaso scored for Celtic and Scott Brown scored, right? And um, if this is the worst team since the 90s, I'm going to read through the Celtic team that played that day. Um, good, bad and indifferent, I'm going to read through it. Craig Gordon, Izagiri, Van Dyke, Ambrose, Denier, Brown, Johansson, McGregor, Skepovic, Commons and Wacaso. And the subs that came on were Kyle, Stokes and Tonev. Now, some cracking players in there, but as a team under Ronnie Dyler, is that a better team than the one we've got now, do you think, JP? I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have said so. And then people would be like, oh, we had Van Dyke. And it's like, well, Van Dyke was really good for us, but he's been absolutely unbelievable for Liverpool. And he was pretty great for Southampton as well, which obviously earned him the move to Liverpool. Like He had to do a bit more down there before he got to Liverpool. So, no, nah, it, it, it always kind of uh, annoyed me a little bit when I, when I was reading comments because I was just like like that this season when you're like, we are, we are not that bad. <laughs> it's just, I think we just, we got obviously pretty spoiled under Ange Postacoglu. We had a flair player in Jota that, that lit up the game and when you lose somebody like that, it kind of does make you think a bit differently about this side. But players come and go. Jota left. We've now got a guy in Nicholas Kuhn who looks a little bit Jota-esque at times. I'm not saying he's 
as good as or will be as good as him, but he has that same dynamic to his game, I think. So, um, and you know, look around the rest of the team, Cameron Carter Vickers, most people you speak to would say that he's possibly the best centre half they've seen in their lifetime at Celtic. I mean, I, I thought on Sunday, if you'd push me for a man in the match, I would have maybe said Carter Vickers. And that's kind of ridiculous considering Livingston didn't have a shot at goal and we had an enormous amount of possession. And he's a centre half. So why would why should he be getting man in the match in a game where we won three 0 when there was three different goal scorers, albeit one own goal? Uh, but Carter Vickers just he just has a I mean, he absolutely had no no concern over their units that they had uh, to to fling forward at us. He just looks so composed. He's got that ability to get his foot in round a player to just poke a ball away. He's got He's so strong. Um, I, I I think he's he's great. And then, okay, yeah, you could. You know, there's people that still don't like Joe Hart. Joe Hart's been really good for Celtic in the main in his entire time at Celtic in the last yeah. three years. I mean, a really really good signing. Um, a better goalkeeper than many many other goalkeepers we've had in in the last twenty five um, thirty years. And and then you've got Kyogo up front. I mean, how <laughs> some people think Kyogo is the best since Larson. How is Kyogo playing in a Celtic team that's as bad as some of the ones in, from the nineties <laughs> when he's been lauded like that? It's I seen just... Wayne Biggins. I, I actually did. I seen Wayne Biggins. I got to sign my program, um, so I'm sorry, right? Biggins and Kyogo shouldn't have been the same. Sentence. I think I have a program <laughs> saying Stuart Slater, so we're we're, we're eeksy peeksy on that front. I think, but. You're nah, just going to keep it up, he's though. He could do over <laughs> ten thousand. <laughs> nah, it, it it does seem to be a narrative that's crept in that that we are so so bad, and I I just think that's a bit wide of the mark. No, I, I'd agree with that, and I'm keen to get everybody else's uh, thoughts coming in. We're on Thursday, of course. We've been talking about this game every single day this week, as would be uh, expected. But there's other um, narratives at play at the moment. We've got uh, no fans in the ground, obviously. The media laughing at the songs of hate that we are undoubtedly going to hear on Sunday. The arrogant ref appointment, controversially, John Beaton has been appointed ref. Just got to shout this one out, actually, before we go any further, just while I remember. Um, this dropped in today, so thank you to not Megan the Herald, who decided to send us out. It's a joint um, issue uh, for Euro 24, if that's your thing. Go and have a good read at that. Brilliant. Looks absolutely great. I love these Booker zines, JP. They're very, like, Pan and Ario and, and all of these guys. Absolutely brilliant what they're doing. So thank you very much for that. It smells just off the printing press as well. It smells great. I'm a pervert, of course. But, uh, yeah, panini, thank you. Panini sticker smell or different? A bit like that. A bit like the old panini. Aye. Thank you very much. Somebody's just going to cut that wee bit out where I say I'm a pervert eh, and just use it on the social media. What I meant was with things like this football retro stuff and all that, I love all that kind of stuff. So I thank mean, you can't at all be your backdrop. I mean, it's just, just, I've mean, never <laughs> picked up on that. I'm taking a slag in for this. People think this is my bedroom and I'm like one of the 13-year-olds that's got green and white hoops in the, the bedroom. Not quite, not quite. Um, but here we go. This is peak Glasgow Derby taking on an empire. Well, this is the thing. I think it can work in your favour. I think you take every bit of that, all these ingredients, and you put it into the cold and you put it in the pot, into the melting pot, and hopefully uh, from that comes um, an absolutely focused performance, which from the first kick of the ball, we're on it. We can't, like you are saying against Livingston with the pitch, we can't take time to settle into the game. We need to be on it straight off the bat. Now, Pete McGee's asking a question about Calmack. I've got to say, Pete, I've not seen anything yet, but it might have happened whilst we've been on uh, whether or not he is back in full training. But I think there's doubts around whether he's going to start. Uh, and I'll be asking JP if that is the case. Who Who's the starting three in the midfield in just a second? Scotland the Brave acts on, have we covered the importance of not giving away cheap free kicks, etc.? Yeah, because we have got the highest scoring defender in British football history playing <laughs> against us. And, um, you know, he can hit a dead ball. People will say, do your job, the ref don't matter. That's not true of every 50-50 goes against you with fouls. You're spot on. The reason I'm bringing this up, we have dedicated entire shows in the last week to refereeing decisions, JP. We're not going to quite do that. We're, we've only got 10 minutes left here in any case. But it's true in what Scott the Brave says here. Um, something like giving somebody a booking, giving you know, Carter Vickers a booking in the first five minutes of the game, that's pivotal. That's absolutely pivotal 
to the rest of the match. Um, a 50-50 going Rangers is way on the edge of the box is huge, absolutely massive. You know, in the last game against Rangers, Tavernier scored a, a free kick from that distance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's spot on what you're saying. It's difficult. The nuances of making these decisions and when 50-50s don't go your way um, can absolutely um, result in you losing a goal or losing the game, in actual fact. And I don't think it's wrong to focus on that decision that's been made this week. Um, I've called it arrogant. I've called it contemptuous. Certainly controversial to make John beating the referee in this particular game, JP. Um, it followed, of course, the, the programme we put out on Friday night. Alan Morris and myself talking about um, the pattern of assistance. It is a pattern. It's not an anomaly. Um, and when you look at some of the, the stats we were discussing, it's incredible. 25,000 have watched that on YouTube. Uh, 5,000 have listened to it on the audio. It has captured the imagination of a great deal of football fans, not just Celtic fans. Um, when you heard that beating has been announced, you know, Crawford Allen stepping down, JP, it's easy as a Celtic fan to say, right, you're just doing this to really get it up as you're trying every trick in the book to make sure we don't win this game. We've got no fans at Ibrox. You have no question that until recently. It's going to be put into place next season. You're, you're picking the, the least appropriate referee to referee the game, you know. Um, and in the lead up to a high profile ex Rangers player and manager is in the media going on about the hate bill, slagging it off, saying, ah, you know, we, you know, me and others will be breaching that bill. 48,000 others at Ibrox will be breaching that bill on Sunday. This is the backdrop of the game. This is the backdrop of the game. And the SFA have fed into it, JP, with their appointment to beat him. Listen, we could even take it away from being Celtic fans and saying, really, is that appropriate? For your member of staff to be refereeing this game, is that mm. not a wee bit shady? I mean, is it? Do you not have a duty of care to that particular ref? He's he's getting it tight already, JP, and we've even well, kicked the ball yet. Well, he's, he's not going to be subject to any abuse from Celtic fans because there'll be none there. So, True. um, I guess that what will the will the quid pro quo for this be, or? Uh, or the, the yang to the yang of this be we get Kevin Clancy for the, the Celtic Park game, Father Clancy as he's known. I mean, Nonsense. Like, I, I'm surely not, that would be ridiculous. But um, I went, I'd like to have seen Brendan Rogers' reaction when he was told that it was John Beaton. I'm really, I'm sure he probably just burst out laughing. Like, and uh, you know, just a like that genuine meme, that meme where he's looking at the mobile phone at Lennox Town and everybody's in the back laughing, he burst out laughing right. just to be like, Of course, it's him. Of, co of course it's him. I mean, I don't even know if Brendan Rodgers is aware of the, the picture in, in that bar uh, that with, with, with John Beaton. I don't know. He, it doesn't strike me as the type of guy that's trolling through Twitter or doom scrolling at three in the morning reading, you know, what Lint Zishanchenko's put up. But on that, did you see the incident that he put up with uh, John Beaton failing to send off Jamie uh, Joey Garner? Against yeah. Hamilton, <laughs> yep. I mean yep. that. He could Andy 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 Walker actually said incompetent. He called him incompetent. Yeah, yeah. and that's horrific. However many years ago, I don't know, like four, five, six years ago, I don't know. I think that was the, was that the Joey Barton season? Was that no? It's far back as then. I think. Maybe I don't know. Then. I saw Clint Hill in the footage, so who who knows? It was maybe twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen. Who knows? But. Andy Walker actually says the exact same thing about John Beaton that, that Brendan Rodgers did as a commentator for Sky Sports. They just they, they, they showed it about three or four times in slow motion and Joey Garner's laughing at the fact that he's like absolutely like put the guy... There was no need for him to... Even if you made the argument that, oh, he was just going for the ball and he completely missed it, why did he need to go, to the ball, go for the ball with that sort of ferocity in that part of the park? I mean, it was a red card all day long and he didn't give it. And you immediately go, wait a minute, what's going on here? So we've got, unfortunately, we've got 12, 12 13 uh, players to beat, or 13 men to beat. We've got their crowd and the referee. <laughs> so it's up to us whether we've got the testicular fortitude to do that. <laughs> yeah, I said the other day there, we're, we're going to have to score three goals to get two. That's how I'm feeling going into it, JP. But I know that the psychology, the, there could be an, an opposite effect here. That, that is a point, though, eh, that 
can't remember his name. Welcome to Scotland, was it? I, I don't know. The, the, the comment are about the free kicks. Scotland the Brave. Scotland, Scotland the Brave, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Uh, it is a good point because that could be a tactic that plays in. That they, are, that they actually engage in that. They look, look for to draw fouls. So we have to be even more alert to that than normal. And it's obviously so hard when you're playing a game of football and you go for something. But we have to be mindful of that because he is a threat from from free kicks. And obviously the whole penalty scenario. I mean, I said after that Tynecastle game, I was like, I, I, I don't want to see a penalty like that given again, either for us or against us. I just, because you know, that it will come back to haunt you. If you if you get a, a, a decision like that, then you know that somewhere around the corner it's going to go against you. So I'd rather just have no decisions like that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, a great point, right? Because what I was going to say to you, JP, two things, two decisions, right? The Awata penalty at Tyne Castle. If that happens this weekend and it's a Rangers player, uh, so this is like feeding into what you were just saying there. So the, everything around that, right, the furore around that decision being made, uh, going to VAR, beatings on the VAR, that particular situation there, if that happens this weekend, and it might, it may well happen this weekend. Yeah, it's a Rangers arm, right? And they've set, they've set their stall out on this one, JP. Mm -hmm. Then all eyes, the global audience that we spoke about at the top of the show, all yeah, eyes are on. fan base would explode if, they, right. if, if a penalty like that was given against them mm -hmm. on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That decided the game. They would. Uh, they were all laughing at us a couple of weeks ago. But a decision like that, they've they've given themselves the, the situation, the scenario now where if a, a similar thing like that happens and they don't give a penalty, they must give us a penalty. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But and then they, similarly, similarly, if Carter Vickers, mm -hmm. right, if Carter Vickers challenges one of their forwards the way that Kyogo was challenged at the weekend, that can't mm -hmm. be a penalty. Yeah, and that can't be a penalty. Mm -hmm. So I think that in many ways, in a normal world, they've painted themselves into a corner on this one, JP. Whether or not they would stick to these decisions that they've set a stall out on, I'm not so sure. Which is exactly why, so that there's no game of jeopardy happening here, I don't want anything VAR-related to to be a, a, a factor in this game. I, 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 if, we, if they beat us, and they beat us fair and square, and there's no... Jiggery pokery, skullduggery, all the other words, fine. And if we beat them, I would hope that it's on the pitch playing pure, beautiful, inventive football, you know? Love it. Love it. Some more points coming through. Tom has done this a big one. It just shows you, though, that I do bring your points up when you make them on Facebook. And very soon indeed, JP70 peer over the top of that one. Very, very soon indeed, we'll also be streaming live on Instagram. The only reason I can't do it is my account is not, is not yet 30 days old. Not much talk in the Rangers loving media about the Dundee game, which should have been played at least by yesterday. Again, SFA, Rangers bias, Liverpool, Man City, Arsenal, etc. Playing three games in a few days, and that's the so-called best league in the world. Disgusting, disgraceful, shameful behaviour by SFA, SPFL, hail, hail from down under. Um, we, we mentioned that the other day. I mean... It, I mean, with regards to it, I'm pretty sure there'll be a loophole where it says, oh, it doesn't have to be the first available date. It can be any date before the split. They'll come up with something. But obviously, um, whether or not that would... It's not something them. that I'm really bothered about. I could could it have affected them? They may have kept... It made them sharper. I don't know. I don't, yeah. It's a, it's a difficult one. Barry O'Sullivan, uh, a win at Snake Mountain. Anybody who refers to it by its correct title, I'm bringing it up, will send them into a meltdown. JP mentioned it. Can you imagine, right? If if uh, a Rangers defender goes up, the ball ricochets off somebody else and hits him on the arm, and he's faced another way, and Celtic get a penalty. Can you imagine it, Barry? The me the levels of meltdown, JP. But I, Probably, I just never the I, I don't want that to happen. Like I know, I know, I know. I know. in a likely Celtic goal, but I don't want us to win that way. I, I don't. I don't. I didn't want us to lose that way, and therefore I don't want us to win that way either. And that is pretty much my mantra for. VAR and all the nonsense and all the referee nonsense as well. It's just, you, just you, want game. you want a fair game. You do. This, this is all you're asking for. And when you're, you you spoke about um, Father Father Clancy, um, you know, that's right. That is their view on, on that situation. The difference is John Beaton drinking in a Rangers boozer versus Kevin Clancy because you think 
his name would um, suggest that he is a Celtic fan. When he's not, he actually isn't. And I can tell you that with authority, Kevin Clancy is not and has never been a Celtic supporter. And he definitely doesn't support Rangers either. But he's not a Celtic fan. Beaton is a Rangers fan. That's the issue. And all you want is you just want balance. You want fairness. You want transparency. And I think that if given all that, and hopefully we are at the weekend, JP, and we just play them, and it's 11 v 11, I do think that with all our big guns back, even if Callum McGregor doesn't make it, I think we've got enough. I really do. If he doesn't make it, though, I said I was going to ask you, who do you play in the midfield if he doesn't? Because that's, you know, there's there's four players at the moment who are playing pretty well. Uh, even Bernardo Cameron getting a goal. Awata's done well. Matt O'Reilly, goal and an assist. The Otati's back. Who do you play? Well, I'd be astonished if Rio Otati starts at, at Livingston and then doesn't start the following week. I mean, it's a clear indication that that's where Brendan Rodgers is thinking. So you would expect Rio Hattati to pick up the 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 top of the, that diamond, Matt O'Reilly on the right and on the left or left or behind the two, however you want to mix it up. Iwata, I would say. I, I, I don't know how you could see past him really just because of the relationship that he seems to have with Carter Vickers. They were very tidy together on the uh, on Sunday, um, he's match fit and he's clearly got the confidence of the manager because he's been playing him in games to start. To start, um, and yeah, I've not I've not seen anything from him that would make me. The only thing I saw him do that made me a little bit annoyed was when he dithered on the ball at Tynecastle, or he, yeah. he wasn't sharp enough and he got the ball robbed off him at Tynecastle. Cannot do that at Ibrox on Sunday. Um, I would hope that when they watch games back, that was something that was pointed out to them. You've not got 20, 30 seconds. You've barely got five on the ball before you have to release it. And there was a pass there for him out to the left and he didn't make it. And then all of a sudden he was robbed and then they scored. There was a narrowly offside Lauren Shanklin goal that it was a result of that him being robbed like that. So, yeah. But I mean, that's why they watch games back and do their... Uh, their sort of reviews, I'm sure you'd hope <laughs> that, they yeah. go, that they go over things like that. So, but I've, there's plenty of other stuff with the Wata. I mean, he, like the St Johnston game at home, I, I was really impressed with him. He was would have been my man of the match um, over anyone else that game. And without being again, without being overly fancy or anything like that, I mean, he's just he's just a, a guy that. Recycles the ball well. He's strong. Clearly got a good football brain. Wouldn't have got the most valuable player in Japan as a token gesture. I mean, he did it over the course of a season to earn that uh, award. So, uh, yeah, that would be that would be my midfield. I'm, I'm obviously concerned about McGregor and the, the, his lack of game time and everything else. It's such an intense, as he well knows. I mean, there'll be discussions being had between him and the coaching staff over whether or not he himself feels like he could his body could cope with the rigors of a of a game at Ibrox um, and all that that entails. But um fortunately for us, you know, we have got a guy in Awata that I think um could play well there. Yeah, this is a, a good headache to use the old football cliche JP because I think if Rio and, and Matt O'Reilly are fit they play if Cameron, Cameron, if Callum McGregor doesn't play, then there could be a toss up between Awata and Bernardo because you know that Rogers likes Bernardo. Mm-hmm. You know he's played no, in he's, these he's big just games. In the Champions League games. Yeah, he's trusted them in the big games. But Awata, I'm not sure if Awata was even available for those games though in the Champions League. I don't remember him being in the mix for those games. It was Bernardo just started and. I guess at that point there wasn't really anybody else. David Turnbull, maybe. But that's right, aye, because he sat on the bench, didn't he? Yeah. Um, so at that time, I don't remember it. I've been in the mix for that, but but it, yeah, it, de- it definitely does trust Bernardo. And despite Bernardo not being sparkling at the moment, I mean, he did take his goal well on Sunday. Um, looks comfortable playing with, and playing in this current Celtic team with everybody. I mean it. Anybody that's sort of okay 
can suddenly become good as a result of the players that are playing around about them and the, the, the way that they play and the way that they bring you into the, into the game and everything else, which is which is why it's exciting about Hatati, O'Reilly and Kuhn, I think, and then Alistair Johnston as well. That's a really strong mm-hmm. right-hand side. And then Maeda will just be the, the industry on the left-hand side and be that absolute pest to push Tavernier back and stop him getting any ideas about... Uh, trying to score against us again. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. Exactly, exactly. The scene is set, JP. Been looking forward to this discussion on this Thursday afternoon. We got through it without even talking about music, which is quite disappointing for me, certainly. Um, thank you, everybody, for getting involved. 1,600 live on the Thursday bulletin. I really uh, do appreciate every single one of you tuning in and getting involved in the comments. Um, I'm now jumping in a vehicle to go to Glasgow to be joined by Paddy McCourt, at Gracie's, there are 10 tickets available, I'm being informed. So if you do want to come along, you can still get a ticket. Start your uh, Glasgow Derby weekend off early. Maybe phone in sick at your work tomorrow and just keep it going all the way through to Sunday. Mm-hmm. Why not? <laughs> we'll have a wee sing song tonight, I'm sure. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved. And thank you to JP Mason for joining me on a Good Celtic role. State of Mind.